Hello and welcome to today's Aquarium at Home live stream. Now, this is a little bit different. These are not the scaly or furry animals that we so often feature on these live streams. These are some special animal ambassadors that we're going to focus on today. But before we get to talking about who's who on our education guard here, let's meet our educator. This is Susie Grant, who uh, many of you have probably seen many times on these uh, these Facebook Lives. So Susie, say hello. Hello, how are you all today? <laughs> and Susie, I think, is going to take off the mask so that you can actually hear her a little bit better because audio is a little bit of a problem with my phone. So uh, Susie, who do we have here today? We have three of our animal ambassadors that often have a bad rap. We have our tarantula, a millipede, and a Madagascar hissing cockroach. All right, so we were talking about this before the live stream started, and we were not sure who to start with, and so I'm not going to make that decision. I'm going to let those of you who are watching, and there look to be a few of you, decide who you would like to see first. So as Susie said, we've got Madagascar hissing cockroaches, a millipede, and a tarantula. So uh, type down in the comments who you would like to see first. And while you're deciding uh, amongst yourselves who you would like to focus on, Susie, let's talk a little bit about animal ambassador programs because that's always going to come up when we talk. We use that term and externally, maybe it doesn't mean nearly as much as it does internally. So why do we have animal ambassadors and what do they do? Our education ambassador animals are those animals that come out and do programs. So they technically are behind the scenes most of the time, but they come out to make special appearances and they're a way of letting people have an opportunity to meet an animal up close. Sometimes, as in today, like in the case of the millipede, there are things that are in your own backyard, and other times they are from around the world, giving us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them, maybe appreciate and understand their role in the ecosystem on this planet that we share. All right. So uh, you all are not... Ah, okay. So we finally have a, deci a decision, uh, and I'm just going to close the... Close the voting here. Looks like the cockroach wins. So okay. we'll start with the cockroach, which is appropriate because you said they come from all over the world. And uh, as the name implies, this is not from not an animal that you would find in our backyards. It is not. And they're a little bit different than the roaches that we might find here in our area. These are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Sometimes you can hear the little hissing sound that they make. Um, when I'm deciding to be very active here today. But I brought two because they are a male and a female. This one is a female and this one over here is a male. We can easily identify them because the male has these two little bumps on his head. They're almost like horns and they can use those to when they're defending their territory or um, you know, trying to chase off another male. Um, they can also just be to make themselves look big and more impressive, which may make you may signal to the female that they would make a good mate. So Susie, uh, for those of you who are, for the people who are watching, uh, just to give them kind of a sense of scale, could you hold your hand next to them? Because mm -hmm. these are not small. These they are... are not. They're one of the largest types of cockroaches. But one thing that you'll notice about them is they do not have any wings. So they are not going to be one that's flying around. They do spend most of their time down on the forest floor in the rainforest um, in, Ma in Madagascar. And they're going to be crawling amongst the leaf litter um, under rocks and logs and things like that. Now, if you do look at their feet, you can see they've got like little hooks on them, which does make them able to climb up, climb up fairly smooth surfaces. But for the most part, they're going to be down on the forest floor. All right. Now, I have not seen anybody write a comment or a question, but, which I'm a little bit disappointed in those of you who are watching. Surely you've got better question or some questions about an animal that's called a hissing cockroach. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and ask it for you because the obvious question then is, why, would, why do they hiss? Well, they'll hiss for multiple reasons. They actually have identified four different kind of noises that they make, particularly the males. They hiss by forcing air through spiracles, which are down on the sides of their body. And these are little openings on their body that allow them to breathe. And so as they push air out, it can be a way of defending themselves. If a predator is coming up and tries to catch them, they can hiss and that can startle a predator, giving them an opportunity to escape. They also can 
can make a sound when danger is nearby, kind of alerting any others. And then there are a couple of different noises that they make, hissing sounds that they make to um, attract, one to attract the mate and one more in courtship with a female. Okay, so as you were pulling uh, <coughs> these cockroaches uh, out of their uh, enclosure, uh, they were, uh, you might have heard them. Uh, it just sounds kind of like a little puff of air, kind yeah, of. Yeah, it kind of goes, Shh. this is the sound that they kind of make. Yeah, so what, was that just an uh, alarm, I guess, at being moved, or? It is. Ah, there you go, okay. It goes, Shh. you can maybe hear what she does. Sometimes it's just um, when they move around, and some of our cockroaches won't hiss because they are so used to being handled by us and you know we're just much larger than they are so it's kind of they may think of us as wanting to try to eat them until they get used to our handling of them i'm sure we would probably have some choice words and sounds to make we're a hundred foot tall giant to try and carry us off without no telling us why probably all right uh so you said that you brought two of these mm -hmm. uh here how many do we have uh, total. I mean, are, these aren't the only two we have. These are not the only two. We have uh, two different colonies right now. We have a breeding colony because their lifespan is relatively short, generally anywhere from about two to five years. Um, and so we have probably close to 50 adults right now. And then we have just over 100 little ones that are in different stages of growing up. And you recently actually captured, you, we, we saw this a couple weeks ago, uh, I think you showed me some video that you captured on your phone mm -hmm. of uh, them hatching? Yes, so technically the female will hold what we call the uluthika or the eggs inside of her body until about time for hatching. And some people believe that they kind of hatch right before the uluthika is laid or, with up, or up until about two days afterwards. And so we were lucky enough to see one that was just emerging from that uthika. And while they look similar to the adults when they first hatch, they are white and it takes a little bit of exposure to the air for them to start to develop their color. And then they're very, very small. They're just little miniatures of the adults. Can you show us about how small compared to... Mm -hmm. They're going to be like they're tiny they're little bitty things just about like this um and they will as they grow like other insects they have what we call an exoskeleton or a skeleton on the outside of their body that does not necessarily grow along with them so they have to molt or shed that exoskeleton and they will shed six times or they will molt six times before they become an adult all right. So uh, we mentioned uh, that what we're probably going to be doing today is busting a few myths and, and misconceptions about cockroaches. So people probably have, they associate cockroaches with uh, particular conditions, um, maybe cleanliness. So is there any truth to that? Are, are, they, are they dirty animals or... I don't think of them as dirty animals. I think of them more as part of that cleanup crew. They are going to be the ones that are finding dead, rotting things and helping to eat them. And that helps to recycle nutrients back into the ecosystem. So a cockroach like this will find, and they eat primarily plant matter, but dead, decaying plant matter. Occasionally they would eat a carcass if they found it or a dead animal, but for the most part they're going to eat fruit and things that are rotting. And so they're helping again to put those nutrients back into our ecosystems. Seems like you and I uh, frequently discuss the animals that are sort of the janitorial staff of the natural world, because we've also talked about possums. Uh, and uh, one more that I think is escaping me that uh, serves well, a similar role. We have another role. one today. Our millipede is also part of that cleanup crew. And if you think about it, there's a lot of waste. And so we need a lot of animals helping to fulfill that role. All right. Now, I want to make sure I catch up with some of these comments that I didn't realize were coming in. Uh, we've got Gwen Jones, who says, as long as we talk about the lovely tarantula, eventually she's okay with whatever we start with. Well, rest assured, Gwen, as much as I grew up not being a huge fan of spiders, we will, in fact, get to the spider. I will not let my latent arachnophobia get the better of me. In fact, as a matter of fact, just working here, uh, I've actually learned to, if not like spiders i certainly appreciate the role that they play and i susie is that true of uh, any of these animals for you do you feel like you appreciate them better than you might have before you started to work with them well i think that's probably true of a lot of things i would say that 
we all have different experiences that shape us and give us um, kind of preconceived ideas of some of our animals. And so even things like our hissing cockroaches um, are ones that maybe I didn't have the same appreciation for that I do now. And these are actually, uh, unless I'm mistaken, uh, there are people who keep these as pets. There are people who keep them as pets. They're not necessarily um, going to do a lot to interact with you as a pet, like you might think of a dog or a cat doing, and they're very, very fast. So you have to be pretty careful. I mean, because even though they're a large cockroach, this is as large as they get, which compared to us is still pretty small. Now, Olivia Hatcher would like to know how long do they live and what do you feed them? They generally are going to live anywhere from about two to five years. Um, and we feed them a variety of different things. They get a salad a couple of times a week that has things like carrots and broccoli and, and kale and zucchini, apples, grapes. So it's got a wide variety of things in it. On top of that, we make sure they have dog food, dry dog food, which is a good source of protein for them. And we can put fish flakes and things on their food too, just as kind of, you might think about it as an embellishment to their food, to their diet. All right. Uh, Stephanie Murrow would like to know, and this is a good question because people tend to think of cockroaches, you turn on the light and away they scurry. So she would like to know why aren't they running away? Well, I think partially just because they are accustomed to coming out and doing programs, they are nocturnal and they do typically run from the light and they stay buried under leaves and rocks and logs and things like that as a general rule. But again, many of our animals are conditioned to come out at a little different time than they typically would. And uh, for those of you who are joining late, this is a Madagascar hissing cockroach. So this is not your, not your run-of-the-mill cockroach that you might find maybe in your basement. This is a very different species. And as the name implies, this is found in the, the island of Madagascar. So definitely not, definitely not in your backyard. Right. Unless you're watching from Madagascar, I suppose. And you might see he's kind of moving his antenna around right now. The antennae are a very important sensory organ that they can tell a lot about what's going on around them. And one thing that I found really interesting is that they can find a mate by using their antenna. They can actually smell the female, that they have s smell receptors on their antenna that they can identify the pheromones or the chemicals that are released by the female in order to find a mate. And again, if you're tuning in late, this is actually the male. Uh, we do have a female over here. And Susie did go over the, the method of identifying uh, between the two sexes. So can you the just real quick? The easiest thing is these bumps on the top of their head. Um, the male has very pronounced bumps, whereas the female has either none or they're very small little bumps. The male uses those. They can get into like a shoving match with another male that they'll kind of curl their head under and push those knots together. Think about deer antlers as they're defending territory and the male will do something similar. It can also make them look bigger and more attractive to a female. Another kind of interesting thing that they'll do when they're defending their territory, and their territory does not have to be something very large. It could be just a rock that they're gonna hang out on for sometimes several hours before going off in search of food again. Um, but they will do what they call stilting, or standing up kind of on their toes to make themselves look even bigger and stronger. Because usually the cockroach that is the largest and hisses the most is going to be the winner of the battle for the territory or for the mate. Now, these two seem very relaxed at the moment. Like you said, they're, this, is, this is their job and they're good at it. And so we do work with our animals so that they are not constantly under a state of stress to be doing programming and acting as our ambassador animals. Sure. And if you've been to the aquarium and you don't recall having seen these on exhibit, there's a reason for that. Uh, many of the animals that Susie works with in particular are ones that you do not see unless you're happy, you're, you're lucky enough to encounter one of our CART programs, which is what we call the mobile programs that we do on these carts. So uh, Robin Hurt would like to know how many of these live at the aquarium. Uh, you did cover that earlier, but maybe Robin joined a little bit later. Right, we currently have about 40 to 50 adults and then we have just over 100 juvenile or small in varying stages of their life. Some very, very small, like a quarter of an inch to some that are getting closer to a half to three quarters of an inch now. Uh, so Deborah O'Neill would like to know, how are they different from the roaches we sometimes find in our home? Well, 
one of the big things that you'll notice right away is that they do not have wings. And so they cannot fly. They are simply a ground dwelling cockroach, although they can climb trees and things like that if they need to, to get to food. But most of the time they're eating on the forest floor. So that's where they're gonna spend most of their time. On a related note, Cassie Nice would like to know on behalf of five-year-old Dax, uh, do these cockroaches dig? They will kind of burrow a little bit, but they're gonna really rely more on just going underneath the leaves and the logs. But, you know, they may dig out a little bit to be able to get under a rock that will serve as their protection. All right. So this is only one third of the special guests that we have for today. So maybe we'll move on to the next one. And Susie, I'll let this, oh, you can hear that hissing. Not anymore. All right, well, just, just enough for- It's usually for... very quick. <laughs> That's good. That means that they're not, they're not distressed. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Daffron says, hello, Susie. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> All right, so who's next? We're gonna bring our millipede out. It's because our millipede has a similar role to our cockroaches. And this is an animal that you would find potentially right in your backyard. I know at my house, they're moving around quite a bit right now, and they can range in size from anywhere from about two inches to about five inches, four to five inches. Um, and they kind of have this cylindrical body. We can tell that they're a millipede because if we look very carefully at their legs and the segments of their body, we can see that each little body segment that has legs will have two pairs or a total of four legs per segment. The name millipede means thousand feet. Now, they don't typically actually have a thousand feet. They tend to have closer to 300 to 400 feet, depending on the size of the millipede. And you can kind of see how those legs move kind of in a wave-like pattern as it moves around. Maybe he's going to stretch out just a little bit. Like our cockroach, the millipede, this particular kind of millipede is considered a detritivore, which means again, they're going to be eating on those dead leaves, um, any kind of dead plant matter, fruit, potentially a carcass, but for the most part, they're really looking at those leaves and funguses and things like that. So they would also live then under the, the leaf? Yes, they tend to matter. be mostly under the leaf litter. You can see they've got small little antenna compared to the cockroaches and those antenna not only help them to smell, but they also have taste receptors and they can feel things. They can detect different kinds of chemicals that have been released by other um, animals or by other particular millipedes. Um, but yes, they're going to be down on that forest floor eating those leaves that have fallen and have begun to rot. Now, normally we would like to, we prefer to call this our science hour for those of you who are at home with kids and maybe this is substituting for a science class. But this is a little bit of, a, of an opportunity to talk a little bit about math. So if millipede means thousand feet, centipede then means... Anybody want to take a guess? Think that centi is going to be like a century, so it's going to be a hundred feet. And that's because the centipede on the body segments that contain legs will only have one pair of legs, whereas the millipede will have two pairs of legs. And there are other, dis other probably ways to distinguish between centipedes and millipedes. Can you point any of those out, any parts of their body that maybe are a little bit different? Well, a lot of times the centipedes will eat different types of material, and so their mouth parts and things are going to be a little bit different. The easiest thing is to just look at those legs. All right. Now, uh, between the two, is our, should you be worried about either of those, millipedes or centipedes, when it comes to, to handling them or the potential of them to, to maybe bite or otherwise hurt you? Well, with the millipedes in particular, we don't worry too much about them biting us. Their mouth parts are really not designed to bite into something. More as a defense mechanism, one of the things that they will do is curl up in a ball, kind of coil up so that they're protecting their head and their legs. Those are gonna be the softer parts of their bodies. And then they can release a kind of a noxious chemical so that if it gets on our hands, it could 
consider give like a small chemical burn it doesn't for me it doesn't hurt you can't tell that they've done anything so it's not anything serious but they also can discolor so you may have like a purple stain on your hand um, would not be what I would recommend that you like lick your hands to clean them we would want to use our good hygiene and practice what we're doing now with everything is wash our hands good with soap and water but it really doesn't do much of anything other than discolor the all right. Now, can, now, on the flip side, then, are centipedes able to bite you? I believe some types of centipedes are able to bite you because some of them are more carnivorous, so they're going to be more meat-eating and or eating other insects and things like that. So the, there's a greater risk there. All right. So I always recommend that when you see animals like this, that it's best to use our eyes rather than our fingers so that we can watch and see what that animal is doing. Maybe we learn a little bit more about its role in our ecosystem. All right. Uh, Sarah Seiber, uh, again, probably mispronounced that might be Sieber. Uh, that's just my German uh, background coming into play there. But uh, Sarah would like to know, are millipedes always dark in color or do they sometimes have red stripes as well? Or is that a different animal? They can. This is one type of millipede that is found around here. There are other millipedes that can have some yellow and red markings on them as well. The base kind of color is still going to be that dark brown that helps them to hide in the leaf litter. All right. Uh, Cassie Nice is back with another question from five-year-old Dax who would like to know, are they nocturnal? They are. All of the animals that we have today are nocturnal. And part of that for this millipede is it does help them retain moisture because if they get out in the sun, they can dehydrate really quickly and they can have some kind of serious problems. So it's easier for them and better for them to come out at night when there's less light. It's easier to hide, especially with that dark color and it's cooler temperatures. So you often find them in kind of moist, very moist environments. All right, and uh, again, I've already apologized for mispronouncing names, and that's probably going to continue, but uh, Kaylee uh, Daffron says, uh, Ellie says, hi, we miss you, Susie. We miss you all, too. We hope to get to see people very soon. Was that a good pronunciation or a bad pronunciation? Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Kudos to me. Uh, looks like we're, into the, we're at the end of the questions for the millipede, so are there any, any other points that uh, warrant discussion about millipedes before we put well, him or her back? Some interesting things that I learned about our millipede is they can actually be fairly good parents, at least until the eggs hatch. And so a millipede like this may make a nest out of chewed up leaves as well as their own poop. And they build this little nest and then inside the nest they have one egg and the mom will coil around that nest, kind of incubating that egg. I don't know that it's producing any kind of heat, but she's kind of there guarding it, protecting it. And then once the eggs hatch, the babies are off on their own. And the babies are going to look very similar, but they're going to be much smaller. And just as our cockroach molts as it grows, as it sheds that exoskeleton, our millipede will do something, will shed as well. And with each molt, they will add more body segments and more pairs of legs. Wow. So I guess you, if you had an old enough millipede, you might get to that thousand legs? <laughs> Well, I don't know. They generally, are, even at fully grown, are only going to have close to 100 segments. Um, but they have said some of them can have up to about 370 pairs of legs, or 370 or just a little over that legs. So. so I guess if anybody's mad about that, you can take, up, uh, take that up with the insect false advertising department. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mike Jameson hyphen Jackson Stewart. I'm not sure who we're talking to here, but what says that Jameson, age seven, says that he saw three on a hike in the daytime. What does that mean? Well, generally, if you're seeing them in the daytime, it is going to be in a forested area, so you have not a lot of direct sun coming down. They may be out foraging some. They do most of their foraging at night, but especially on a cloudy day or on a day that's not so hot, it's not that uncommon to see them out and about. I saw one yesterday on my deck just out crawling around. Now, is this, this being uh, springtime in the south, are you more likely to see them than you would at other times? I think that you are. First of all, they're just coming out of the winter with the colder months where they're going to be more or less hibernating because they don't um, move around. There's not as much food available. So they are coming out. About, it's also, you can think about it as breeding time. Breeding for the millipede tends to happen 
in late spring, early summer. So that's about the time of year we're at right now and kind of goes through the fall. All right. So we have now discussed the Madagascar hissing cockroach and the millipede. So we've gone from Africa to the Southeast United States. Uh, where are we headed next? We are now going to head to Central and South America. All right. To kind of, this is a curly haired tarantula. Um, and it is often found in places like Honduras and Nicaragua and parts of Costa Rica. All right, so not a spider that you would find in your backyard. Not one that you would find around here. Sometimes people will say they um, think they found a tarantula, and a lot of times that is a wolf spider, is the one that's found around here because they also are large spiders with lots of hairs on them. All right. Now, before we get into discussion of the tarantula, I would like to take a second to acknowledge the fact that we have received a donation during this live stream. And if you're not sure how to do that, there is a convenient button located on your screen that lets you donate uh, quickly and easily. That money does go towards the emergency operations fund that the aquarium set up to help us defray the cost of being closed uh, during the ongoing health crisis. So that money directly supports animal care. So if you love the animals that you see on these live streams and would like to contribute to their well-being and uh, their caretaking during this time, donating uh, to the emergency donations fund or emergency operations fund is one of the easiest ways to do that and to directly benefit them so thank you very much for that donation and hopefully we'll get more during this live stream but if not hopefully you all are just enjoying getting a chance to get a little bit more insights into these really fascinating often misunderstood animals and I will have to say this is one of my favorite animals and again it's one I learned a lot about in working here but they're just a very interesting and again very misunderstood animal because many times people look at them and they are very nervous about them or very scared to be around them. Part of that is because they're hard for us to relate to. Not only are they small but they've got lots of legs and they're very very fast when they want to be. Most of the time you'll see she's going to be just like this and sitting very still because she is an active hunter. If you look, she does have these little organs called spinnerets. This is where she would weave silk. And just like all spiders, she does have the ability to weave silk. However, she does not weave it to catch insects with. She catches her prey by actively hunting. She will hide, wait for an insect to come close, and then she will move very quickly and reach out and basically grab that predator. So her silk is going to be used more for lining a burrow or for protecting her eggs. Now, is that something that she shares in common with, with wolf spiders? Because my understanding is that wolf spiders also do that. Yes, it's another similarity between them. All right. So uh, tarantulas are, if you know nothing about spiders, you probably think of tarantulas as being among the biggest spiders. So how big is this tarantula? compared to, you said it's a curly-haired tarantula? This is a curly-haired tarantula. So how big is this individual uh, compared to the size that the species can reach? Well, she is an adult. And so again, if I put my hand here, she's about the size of my hand. Now there are other tarantulas that can get larger than that, like the Goliath bird-eating tarantula. But for a curly hair, she is an adult right now. All right. So that big size probably uh, helps her to catch larger prey, I'm guessing. So what are the kinds of things that she would eat? She is going to eat primarily insects. That's part of their job or their niche in the environment is that they can think about them as the pest control. And they're going to eat a lot of insects, um, other types of invertebrates. Um, and occasionally they might eat a small mammal, like a tarantula this size can eat a a pinky mouse, you know, a little baby mouse, if it were to come across one. And it's really amazing when you think about it because you don't see a large mouth. They cannot take a bite out of something. Instead, they eat by this really amazing way called external digestion. And so as they hunt, they're going to use their fangs to bite into their prey. And as they bite their prey, they're injecting venom that helps to paralyze their prey. And it also starts the digestion prep. Um, process. So it's going to kind of turn the insides of that animal into a more liquid diet 
think about like a milkshake or something like that and then it's got a pumping stomach that pulls that already digested food up into its body and that's what would allow it to eat a larger prey item like a large cricket or a small mouse or something. So again, just like many of the other animals that we focused on during this live stream, uh, they are often misunderstood. So what are some misconceptions or preconceptions or myths about tarantulas that uh, could do with some busting? Well, I think the, the big thing is their importance in the ecosystem as helping to eat those insects. They're very, very important there. One of the other things that if you ever see them in movies, they're put in to be the scary animals that give the impression that they would be a deadly animal to come across. And in fact, the tarantula, like this one, has a very mild venom. I have not heard of a case where people have outright died, and the research that I've done has said that people don't die from tarantula venom. Now, you could have an anaphylactic or an allergic reaction to them, but the bite of this animal would be more like a bee sting. So it'd be uncomfortable, but it's not going to be the deadly thing that it's um, made out to be. Another interesting thing is the way that they do protect themselves. She's not quick to bite. Um, we are able to handle her, and but she does not. She's not very quick to bite. Instead, she's got another way of defending herself. And if we were to look at her abdomen, you can see kind of the pinkish-looking hairs, and then what looks kind of like velvet underneath. She looks like she would be very soft, which is one of the things that led to another name for her. Some people call her a teddy bear tarantula because she looked kind of fuzzy. But the pink hairs are what we would think of as guard hairs, and then the velvety looking hairs underneath are called urticating hairs. And urticating is a medical term that would mean irritating. That's her primary means of defense. And she can take these back legs and brush it across her abdomen, and it kind of flicks those little irritating hairs away from her body that could cause a real severe itching, especially if they were to get into an animal's nose or tongue or things like that. That again, gives the tarantula an opportunity to get away. So that sounds like despite the fact that people often think of uh, spiders as being predatory and something to be afraid of, that actually there are things that they need to be afraid of. There are. They actually are prey species for many different kinds of animals, different types of birds and lizards, and even people. In their native countries, people will roast them, and they are considered a delicacy. So they're right to be nervous about big things like us coming their way. All right. Uh, now we've got... <laughs> My mom would like to know, uh, can people grow out of arachnophobia? I think that if you work at it, you can and do it in slow doses. I would certainly say, you know, learn because a lot of times our fears are based on misunderstandings or not knowing. And so the more we can know about the animals, then we can understand them better. I'm not going to say it's going to make it all go away, but it sometimes can help. Well, and as my mom is well aware, I have, I grew up and was very afraid of spiders, uh, but I am very close to one right now, and I am not shaking, as you can probably tell from the camera, and I've had to get even closer to get some macro or very close-up photos of uh, this particular animal, so again, I think it's just a case of now I have a healthy respect and appreciation for them, if not necessarily a desire to have one as a pet. And that's a good thing. They make the best animals are in their own natural environments and not necessarily in our homes. But as long as we can learn to appreciate them and learn to live together with the animals that are in our backyard, then we're doing very good. Uh, Ashley King Cheros would like to know how many eggs can she lay at one time? We've talked a lot about uh, reproduction on this yes. particular live stream. And they can lay anywhere from close to 100 to 500 eggs. Some places say greater than 500 eggs. So they can have quite a few little ones and they don't have to do a lot of parental care. Oftentimes they will guard the egg sac, and, but then once the babies have hatched, then they are on their own. All right, now if Brooke Gorman, if she's still watching, would not mind, would not mind reminding me what today's Weekday Wonders question is. We talked about it earlier, and now I cannot, for the life of me, remember what it has to do with. Uh, so, Brooke, if you're still watching, if you don't mind typing that in the comments, I'll pass it on to Susie, and we'll pretend like we haven't had this discussion, so it seems as if I remembered it uh, like a good presenter. In the meantime, Ashley king Charles would also like to know, how well can she see, and does she hunt by sight? She does not hunt by sight. Um, she has eight eyes. All eight of her eyes are right on this little top knot. 
They're very simple eyes and they really distinguish between light and dark. She can sometimes sense that there's something really large there. The primary way she's going to hunt is by feeling vibrations. And she's gonna do that with these hairs on her legs. Those hairs are not hair like we think about hair on the top of our heads or on our bodies. Instead, those hairs are actually sensory receptors, part of her exoskeleton that can detect vibrations. And so if an insect is moving around, it's gonna send off vibrations and depending on which legs and where on the legs, can give them an idea of where that um, prey species is so that they can very accurately pinpoint and catch their prey. All right, now we do have some help on our weekday wonders. It looks like Shannon Colbert, uh, my partner in crime, has come to my rescue and says, are there different kinds of life cycles? There are different kinds of life cycles and some animals are going to be born or like our tarantula here that is going to look very much like their adult. And now they will continue to grow, but there's not gonna be a lot of changes um, as they grow. Whereas other animals, think about a frog, starts out life as a tadpole. And so it looks nothing like it's going to when it reaches adulthood. And so it's gonna go through that metamorphosis. A caterpillar turning into a butterfly has a little, it also goes through metamorphosis much like the frog does. However, the caterpillar has what we tend to think of as a rest state. It's not really resting because a lot's happening, but when it's in the chrysalis and it's not really moving around and feeding, whereas the frog, when it's going through metamorphosis, does stay active throughout that. There's also differences in the way animals start their life. It's like some give live birth, some lay eggs, some have a lot of parental care, and some have very little parental care. And so there's a lot of variety and variation in how animals not only start their life, but also in how they grow up and even on how long they live. Excellent answer to our Weekday Wonders question. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what Weekday Wonders is, that is our series of curated educational content created by the members of our education department, like Susie uh, and Brooke, who I tried to get to help me out earlier. Uh, and all of that content is available on our website at tnaqua.org under the Aquarium at Home section. And then if you click on Weekday Wonders, that'll give you access to all that content, which is released in packets that kind of come out once a day, Monday through Friday. So they're a way to make sure that your kids are able to get outside, get a little bit of fresh air, do some physical activities, some things that are uh, in those packets. It's a fairly diverse array of activities, but some of them include things like animal themed yoga poses, nature journaling, that sort of thing. Lots so of different games and activities to participate in. It gives kids a lot of freedom, but also at the same time allows them to continue learning in a fun way. Maybe they don't even realize they're learning. Well, and I always like to say that right now, uh, a lot of our worlds, our respective worlds are much smaller than they have been before uh, quarantine was put in place. So this is a way to make sure that you're getting the most out of your little, your little world uh, by maybe looking at it a little more closely or in a different way than you normally would. It gives us an opportunity to really discover who our wild neighbors are. Awesome. All right, now, uh, even though it looks like Susie has put another spider out here because our first spider has essentially not moved since you put, put, uh, put it down, but uh, this is not an extra spider. It is not, and it's very typical for spiders to stay very still because that does help to hide them. But just like the other animals that we've talked about, our spider has an exoskeleton or a skeleton on the outside of its body. So it's similar, it's made up similarly to the material that makes up your fingernails, except that it does not grow along with them. And so they open up what we call the back of the carapace. That's that, uh, or the carapace is on the back of the cephalothorax or the head and chest region. So they open up that carapace and they will um, roll over on their back and then they have to pull their entire body out of it. And you can see there's not much in the abdomen or this back part of the tarantula. You can think about it kind of like a balloon. And so when it pulls its body out, it's just like that balloon deflates. But this allows you to see the inside of it would look like each of those you can see the openings where the legs would go if I flip it over you can see them like the mouth parts with the covering over the fangs and you'll notice that our tarantula has only one pair of fangs whereas many of those spiders that are building a web in a tree um, are going to have two pairs of fangs because they're going to feed a little differently if she's going to use her fangs more in a vertical movement to 
um, use the ground as a hard surface when she's catching her prey. Whereas an insect that's caught in the web, they use um, the fangs, oftentimes they're horizontal, and so they will go through to, again, do the same process. All spiders eat by that external digestion. All right. Uh, Renee Burns says, I saw tarantula, a tarantula migration in Amarillo, Texas one time. It was amazing. They are amazing. I would love to see something like that, too. <laughs> All right, and then Ashley King Charis is back with another question, which is, does she have a name and how old is she? So it's actually two questions, but uh, we'll allow it. Yeah. Well, she is, we don't have a name, like a pet name for her. We just call her a curly hair tarantula. We, um, because I think that really kind of describes her. These hairs on her legs will actually kind of curl. And so um, it's very appropriate. Or like I said, they're also called that teddy bear tarantula. Um, and as far as how old she is, currently I do not have an age on her. A lot of our animals come to us as an adult, and so we don't have an exact um, age for each one. I will tell you that we can look at them and see that she is a female, and that means she has a longer lifespan than, say, her male counterpart. The males may only live to be two to five years old, some up to 10, whereas the females can live up to about 25 years of age. Wow, that's a big dis big discrepancy. It really is, and that's because the female is going to be producing those eggs, which is going to ensure that the species continues. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, people, in fact, you just mentioned that they also call this a teddy bear tarantula, and partially because those hairs look like they would be pretty soft. What does she feel like? They are pretty soft, um, especially those little velvety hairs that you can see them really well on the um, underside of the molt. But they are pretty soft, but they're still going to have kind of a rigid feel to them because they, that is their skeleton. So it's not bone and it's not as hard as our skeleton is, but it does give it that kind of rigid feel, um, kind of covered by that soft velvety fur. All right. Well, uh, we have run out of questions, and Susie, we've also run out of animals. So uh, this seems like a pretty good place for us to wrap up today's live stream. And hopefully those of you who have stuck with us during this uh, 35, 40 minutes, it seems like, have learned some things about these animals that if you already love them, hopefully you love them more. And if you didn't love them, maybe you have come to either, if not love them, then maybe appreciate them and the role that they play in nature and in their respective ecosystems, because every animal has a place that exists there for a reason. And even if you don't know what that reason is, that does not mean that it's not worth saving and having around. So thank you all very much for watching. I will have one, it looks like there's one last question. Ashley King Chero says, how often does she molt? And then we'll finish wrapping this up. Those are, that's a great question. And how often they molt depends on a lot of different things. When they are young, they molt fairly frequently because as they grow to reach their adult size, which happens within the first one to two years, but then once they become an adult, then they don't molt all that often. Some only molting about once every five years. Some will molt any, you know, from one to three years. And a lot of that is because molting is a very dangerous time for a tarantula. You know, for that, it takes almost 24 hours in some cases to complete that molt. And in that time, they don't have any way of protecting themselves. They literally roll over on their back with their legs outstretched in the air and um, very slowly and meticulously have to pull that body, including all those hairs on their legs, out of that exoskeleton. So if a predator comes around, they can't really do anything to protect themselves. They also have to be careful because if humidity is not right, it can cause serious injuries and even death during molting. So once they become an adult, they don't want to have to molt all that often. And the, some reasons that they might molt are to replace those urticating hairs. They will actually develop bald spots if they flick too many of those hairs and they can't just regrow them. They get a new set with each molt. So kind of a long answer, but when they're little, they may molt, you know, every few months, whereas an adult, they may make, or they may um, molt once every one to five years. Okay. Uh, and then before we, we say goodbye officially, Christine Bowles says that Eliana, age 16, lover of all things creepy and owner of five tarantulas, says squee. 
I think that's pretty exciting. I have a 14 year old who also loves tarantulas. <laughs> All right. Well, though that is, an, that is an excellent comment for us to end this live stream on. But again, if you are interested in checking out any of that Weekday Wonders content we just got through mentioning or a lot of other resources we have compiled under the Aquarium at Home heading, go to our website, tnaqua.org. Click on the, to the Aquarium at Home subsection, and there you will find Weekday Wonders along with some resources associated with IMAX films that we have showed in the past, including some links to how to view a few of them for free, as well as educational guides to go along with those films if you'd like to watch in a more engaged fashion, and uh, some playlist archive, some playlist archiving previous live streams we've done, and just a whole host of other things. So do go to that website, tnaqua.org, check out Aquarium at Home, and in the meantime, we will say goodbye to Susie, to our curly-haired tarantula, to our Madagascar hissing cockroach, and our millipede. Wish them all an excellent day, and we will see the rest of you who have watched this live stream. Hopefully, you'll join us again tomorrow at about 1 p.m. when we will go live again. And in the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your day. Susie, thank you very much. And thank you all.